Hello again, Manchester Academy. This week it's autobiography this week and I'm reading What Makes Us Stronger by Freya Lewis, who's one of the survivors of the Manchester Arena attack. <coughs> Chapter 12, Hair. I was back to my game of staring up at the ceiling. Mum was sitting next to me reading when I suddenly had a vision of cat ears. Mum, I said. When the explosion happened, I was lying on the floor and out of the corner of my eye, I could see these dangling cat ears. Mum's chest rose anxiously. They'd melted into your head, she said quietly, and so had the plastic backpack you'd been wearing. That's why we've been finding it so difficult to brush your hair. My mind darted back to the sports bag. Before the concert started, Nell and I had gone off to the merchandise stand in the foyer, foyer of the arena, and she'd helped me pick out a hot pink Ariana t-shirt. Let's get these as well, I'd said, pointing at the matching hot pink wristbands. Giggling, we wiggled the bands over our hands while the guy at the stand popped my t-shirt into a black drawstring plastic bag. I looped the strings over my shoulders so the bag bobbed on my back as Nell and I linked arms and ran off towards the doors leading to the arena. We were so excited that we were nearly tripping over ourselves. Flash forward to after the attack happened. I saw myself lying on the floor of the train station. Paramedics hunched over me, metal glinting. What I didn't realise at the time was that they were using a pair of scissors to try and cut the bag out of me because the plastic was seeping and melting into my hair. The drawstring stuck in my arm like a piece of cheese wire slicing through the wedge of cheddar at a supermarket deli counter. We tried to wash your hair while you were unconscious in ICU. Mum's voice brought me back into the room. Every time I kissed you all I could smell was burning. It was upsetting Dad too. And we were desperate to get rid of the smell, but it was impossible. She said even now my hair was dirty, that it was knotted with lumps of plastic and shrapnel. It might need to be cut off. My eyes instantly watered. Mum, please, I don't want my hair cut off. I know it sounds silly, but in that moment, out of all my injuries, this upset me the most because I love my hair. To a teenage girl, hair is everything. When I was younger, it was chin length, cut in a bob, a pale blonde, wispy halo framing chubby cheeks. But after I started high school, I started growing it, looking after it, brushing it, conditioning it. And as a result, my hair had become thicker and shinier. By the time the concert came around, it was my crowning glory, a swinging blonde sheet. Every morning before school, I'd style it differently. High ponytail, French plait, pigtails, fishtail side plait. Now, laying here helplessly, I couldn't even brush it. It felt matted and dirty around my neck, leaving a trail of grimy oiliness on my skin. I'd do anything to have it washed. Then something amazing happened. One of the ward sisters, Emma, said that she'd arranged for a couple of her hairdresser friends, Simon and Karen, to come in and sort my hair out for me. I was so touched and incredibly thankful. I knew that when the hairdressers came, I'd need to get myself out of bed and sit in the big blue armchair tucked in the corner of the room to give them easy access to my head. It would be a challenge. Up until then, I'd only managed to sit up in bed, but washing my hair was such a run-of-the-mill thing to do. In my mind, I had to do it to prove to myself that I still could. So the day before the hairdressers were due to come in, with the help of my physio, I set myself the goal of sitting up with my legs dangling off the side of the bed. I took a deep breath and used all my strength to hoist myself up and over, battling against the frame on my right arm and heavy boots weighing me down. Freya, you did it! Mum, who's normally incredibly softly spoken, jumped up from her seat, whooping and clapping as if she'd just won the lottery. Go, Freya! Georgia shrieked. As my family cheered me on, I gave a faint smile, but in my head I thought, I feel so sick. The room was spinning again and my stomach was in knots. I had a bucket next to me and I kept glancing at it, thinking, I'm going to puke. After a few moments, the physio eased me back down onto the bed and I'd never been so relieved to be lying down. Staring at the ceiling, I willed my stomach to settle. No matter how much pain I was in, I knew I'd have to attempt it again the next afternoon for my hairdressing session. When the time came, I took a deep breath and managed to sit on the edge of the bed again. The physios had whirled in a hoist to help me transport from the bed to the armchair. It looked like those huge trolleys you find in DIY stores to carry heavy goods and took up most of the space in the cubicle. The hoist went underneath me and then lifted me up as it moved. As it moved, my frame was squashed into my side. I screamed out in pain. I know it hurts, but you need to breathe through it, the nurse said. They gave me extra painkillers and I screamed all the way until they eased me down into the big blue armchair. It was the first time sitting in anything which wasn't my bed. And it was so uncomfortable, my body seemed to collapse in on itself like a deflated balloon, reminding me of how injured I was. 
My mum came and sat on the bed opposite me. I know that was hard, but look at you. You're set up. You should feel so proud of yourself. I looked at her smiling face and tried to breathe through my pain like the nurse had told me to. Just then, the hairdressers came in. Hi, Freya. I'm going to try and sort out your hair. Is that okay? Yes, I replied, smiling in relief. It took an hour of brushing and untangling before they managed to run a comb through it. How are you managing to sit there for so long? I don't know, Mum said, wincing as they tugged at my hair. But I didn't care if they broke another bone doing it. I knew it would feel so good to have my hair washed. Eventually, they managed to untangle it and wash out most of the muck. But there was still a small section at the back which was extremely damaged. We'll have to cut it out, they said. I was apprehensive, but they reassured me that it wouldn't be noticeable. And after two hours, they'd finally finished. Dad took a photograph of the back of my head for me, and when he showed me the picture, I couldn't believe it. Shiny, glossy, golden. My hair looked like something out of an advert. Thank you so much, I said, welling up at the hairdresser's generosity and kindness. You don't know how much this means to me. Before they left, they styled it in two Heidi light plaits so it would be easy to manage. I could just about reach with my right hand and stroke them, making me feel so much better. It was a style I often did for school, and back in bed I started to think about my friends. I felt so guilty that I wasn't there to comfort them, and suddenly had an idea. I want to let school know that I'm okay, I said to Dad as he sat with his legs crossed in the chair next to me. Maybe I should go and do a speech in assembly. Dad looked surprised. When we get there, we can think about it, he replied. I will get there. I want to do that, I said determined. And as the day went on, thoughts continued to swirl about how my friends must be feeling about the attack, how heartbroken they must be about Nell and worried about me here in hospital. For the first time, I started to feel anger towards the suicide bomber for doing this to us and suddenly had an overwhelming desperation to see his face, to see the man who'd caused so much devastation. I want to see him. I want to see the bomber, I said to Dad. Dad, Mum and Georgia all looked at me, faces turning milk pale. I don't think that's such a good idea, Dad replied. Dad, I think I need to see it. Dad hesitated as if he were battling in his own head about what he should do. Then he started scrolling through his phone. He stared at the screen for a few moments, then he pointed it towards me. When I saw the image, I felt instantly shocked. I was transported back to the night of the concert as my consciousness was flooded with fresh memories. After the gig had finished, Nell and I were in the foyer, walking towards the train station. She'd gone to put her drinks cup in the bin. I'd gone out. I'd got out my phone to type down a message and saw this guy stood in the centre of the foyer, dressed all in black, glasses, a baseball cap. It was the man in the photo. I saw him, I said quietly, my voice trembling. I saw him.